Hey guys, I just wanted to bring to you the pretty incredible near-death experience of late psychiatrist George Ritchie. George was clinically dead for nine minutes and got to meet the Son of God. A few things that you should note that nearly all near-death experiencers say. One is 360 degree panoramic vision, and another is direct mind-to-mind -mind communication or some form of telepathy. What you think is what you say. This is a great reason for us to purify our hearts and our minds. Without further ado, here's George Ritchie's near-death experience. It was the 1st of December, 1943. Private George Ritchie was stationed at Camp Barkley, Texas. He had just been chosen to attend the Medical College of Virginia and was waiting to be sent to Richmond to begin classes. A week before he was to board the train, he checked into a hospital due to an upper respiratory infection. The day before his scheduled departure, he felt his condition worsening, but tried desperately to prove that his health was satisfactory. It was the last train out of Camp Barkley that week. Missing the train to Richmond would possibly mean missing the opportunity to attend medical school. Richie spent that entire night in coughing spasms with an uncontrollable fever. He was aware that his condition was severe. His fever was abnormally high. He had already been trained as a medical and surgical technician, so he was in a state of shock when he saw that the thermometer had reached over 106 degrees. The medical staff arrived to transport him by ambulance to have an updated chest x-ray done. Private Ritchie collapsed, and his condition deteriorated throughout the next 24 hours. Eventually, he was pronounced dead. His chart reading expired from double lobar pneumonia. Then the officer gave orders to prep him for the morgue. From there, George Ritchie tells of what he experienced during the time that he was pronounced dead. From a subjective point of view, I'll have to tell you what I was experiencing. I knew I had missed my train. So I'm looking all around this rather dark room trying to find my uniform. Couldn't find it, and decided that I didn't have any more time to waste that, so I come on out of this little room into the hall, and I'm crossing, getting ready to go outside when I see this ward boy coming down. I turned around to him to tell him to watch where he was going, and either he walked through me or I threw him. Now, this kind of shocked me, but when I hadn't made up my mind I was going to get to Richmond, I was going to get to Richmond, so this didn't shock me. I go on out to the door, going to the outside, and as soon as I got outside of that door, I'm um, suddenly up into the air, varying between 500 feet to 500 yards above the ground, going at an incredible speed. And finally I come to this large river, I see this city on the other side. I let down just in front of this white all-night cafe, because I saw this civilian getting ready to go into the cafe, because I wanted to ask him if I'm heading in the right direction to get to Richmond. What city is this? Excuse me, sir. Can you just tell me what city this is? I'd really appreciate it. I was on my way to Richmond, and I seem to have gotten lost. Please. This was the second time that another human being acted like they could neither hear nor see me. So I went over to lean against the guy wire of a telephone post, and my hand goes through the guy wire of the telephone post. Then it suddenly hit me that I had left something back there in that bed in Barclay, and I knew, because I was still using massive denial, that I'd better go back and get it. And I made the next, or the first most important discovery about being outside of your body. That you really go where your soul sincere desires. That time and space as you and I comprehended in this level doesn't exist because in little, no time at all, I was right back there in the front of the hospital. But I had made a very tragic mistake. I hadn't looked to see which ward I'd come out of, much less which room. I could see the soldiers lying there in the bed. And we take for granted we know what we look like, but we don't. Because, you see, we really have never seen ourselves from here up, except in the two-dimensional object we know as a mirror. And I saw a lot of soldiers that looked like me, but none of them had my fraternity ring on the finger. And I'm going through from ward to ward, room to room, trying to find me, and becoming more desperate. Finally went into this little isolation room, and lying over in the bed with a sheet pulled up over its head was this body. I realized it was me because I recognized my fraternity ring and it even had a chip on the black ornix because it was a Pi Gam fraternity ring and there wasn't any mistake. And I am utterly petrified. No, please. 
My massive denial has broken down. I suddenly realize that that body is dead. And I'm too young to die. I'm only 20 years of age. And then all of a sudden, I thought the light at the head end of the room was getting brighter. But it was growing in an intensity of light to where if you turned on a million welders' lights, you'd have some idea of the intensity. Three things happened at the exact same moment. Something deep inside of my spiritual being, not the corpse lying over in the bed, said, stand up in the presence of the Son of God. At that exact same instant, out of this brilliant light stepped the most amazing being I have ever met. And those hospital walls virtually disappeared. I saw every single minute detail of my life, everything I had ever done in public and private, from, from seeing my own cesarean section birth to my 20th year when I was pronounced dead. And uh, he threw a question, what had I done with my life? And I thought, well, I'm an Eagle Scout. Immediately he shot back that glorified Jew. And the same question again, what have you done with your life? Now over there in that realm, there is no such thing as hypocrisy because one of the first things that you become aware of is that the other being is totally aware of what you think. So you can't think one thing and say another. There's no such thing as misunderstanding what he meant. And yet, here was a being that knew everything about me. And he totally accepted me and he totally loved me. Now that blew my mind. The next thing that took place was that the Christ motion to me to come over close to him. Now you can well imagine by this time, I really do think that I've seen everything, but I'm finding out this is just the beginning because suddenly he's opening up another realm to me. Now I wanted to stay there, but then I suddenly realized that the Christ was pulling me away and that we were heading back into this isolated room in Camp Barclay Station Hospital right out of Abilene, Texas. Private George Ritchie's death was confirmed by Dr. Donald G. Francie, captain in charge during the time of these events. Dr. Ritchie's book, My Life After Dying, contains the elaborate account of the various realms of the afterlife that he claims to have experienced. It is a detailed look at one man's encounter with death and what he believes lies beyond. My next guest died and not only lived to tell about it, but he wrote a best-selling book called My Life After Dying. Will you please welcome Dr. George Ritchie. How nice to have you on the show, Dr. <laughs> and you were the one that influenced Dr. Moody who's coming out next. What happened to you? Well, I was in the army. I was 20 years of age, and I was pronounced dead from double home bar pneumonia. They know that I was dead nine and a half minutes because the... He told the ward boy to take me to the morgue, but the ward boy thought he saw something move, so he asked him to come back and check me over, and he told him I was just as dead the second time as I was the first. And then he did give a shot of adrenaline directly into the heart, and four days later I became really conscious again. What happened during those nine minutes? Uh, what did you see? What happened? John, this is why I've written this book. Yes. I met the Christ because I was told to stand up, uh, you're in the presence of the Son of God. He came into my room. And he conducted me through four different realms of life after death. He t really brought out three things that changed my life, and I think was a major reason he told me I had to come back because I didn't want to come back here. You didn't want to come back. No, I absolutely did not. What are the three things? All right, the first thing, can you imagine being in the room with somebody who knows every single minute detail of your life yeah. and totally accepts you and totally loves you? And that's the first wonderful thing. I found out that the one person I could always talk to just as quick and dead was in the loving department instead of the judging department. The next thing that he showed me by taking me through four different realms of life after death is that you and my father doesn't send us any place. The type of life we live here determines where we're going when we leave here. It does determine. Yes. He doesn't send us to heaven or hell or purgatory or anything else. But you don't leave, say, kindergarten here and start the university. You've got to go through grade school, intermediate school, high school, and the type of grades you make your interest determine which university you're going to. So uh, if, you're, if you're a bastard, you don't get a good hereafter. No, you Cheer really, me up. You really don't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All I right. don't think you're going to have to cheer yeah. you. No, but I know a lot of people are just going to make sure we're not going to meet again so fast. <laughs> well, let me put it this way. Over here we have a saying, birds of a feather flock together. Right. Over there you have to flock together because it's too embarrassing to be with people who don't think the same way you do. And George is going that's right. <laughs> and you have mental telepathy over there, so you can't, uh, you can't take somebody for a ride with your thoughts. What you actually think is instantaneously aware to them. Right. So you go to whatever realm, 
you're best suited to go to. All right. What? So now, give me the three things again, very again. All right. First, First, that we really do have, because Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen what the Father is like. We have a God of love. A God of love. Who's right. always for our good interest. Right. Second. Second, that there are many different realms of life after death, not just two. But we go, depending on, depending on what, what type of life and what our interest is here, depends on where we start off over that. And the third? Third, that life really is forever. We don't die. Okay. Death is nothing more than just a gateway through which we go. And you, you, you agree with this, Joe? Yes, definitely. Yes, sir. When we come back, uh, we're going to bring on Dr. Moody and Daniel uh, Brinkley to talk about my trip to Alabama and again to continue on with this because it's just fascinating. We'll be right back. Please stay with us. <laughs> 